takes us on a harrowing journey to the heart of darkness. I'm crawling through the dense jungles of Cameroon with a man we call the Virus Hunter. He's in a race to stop a virus before it can infect human beings. What our work is focused on is understanding what's out there that could potentially harm us as a species. If you think this has nothing to do with you, think again. Inside the bush, animals hold the potential for worldwide danger. These paths are not just local roads. They are a virus's highway. When you see a logging road, what do you think about? I think about the potential for both animals as well as humans with new viruses to get to cities, cities where you have planes, cities where you have boats. So things that happen in Central Africa don't stay in Central Africa. You got it. The bridge from animal to human? It's believed that fruit bats are the main reservoir of Ebola, carriers who don't get ill but spread the disease to other wild animals. And then to humans through bushmeat, raw meat from apes, monkeys, and others killed for food, and who may carry the virus with them. But this meat doesn't always stay in the bush. Poachers sell it on the black market, and it's smuggled around the world, sold to immigrants longing for a taste of home. A few years ago, ABC News correspondent Dan Harris found what seemed to be black market bushmeat in this New York supermarket. How much is sold that one? It's a, it's a pound, $20 a pound. Ah, $20 a pound, that's too much money. Yeah, man. I mean, so this seems to indicate that this stuff is not hard to get. We know that it's readily available not just in Queens, but also in parts of Washington, D.C., um, parts of um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, other centers around the country. And it's because people have a passion for bushmeat. They want that taste from home. This African immigrant, a mother of 10 named Mamie Manet, was sentenced to three years probation for importing crates of monkey meat which she has said her community consumes to celebrate religious holidays. Are you guys selling bush meat out of here? No. No? No, bush meat, no. Fish, dried fish, snails, bush meat. We, t we had a hidden, uh, an investigator with a hidden camera come in here, and he found what he said was cane rat from Africa. No. So nothing, no nothing whatsoever. Bush meat? Yeah. Okay. Now, and you're the owner, you say? The CDC says they're concerned. Experts say that meat like this could potentially be teeming with Ebola. Or worse, undiscovered viruses carrying unknown threats. That's why Dr. Nathan Wolf's research is critical. Searching an animal's blood for tiny microbes, diseases that could grow into lethal pathogens. It's not alarmist. It's happening. The deadly swine flu that killed 18,000 worldwide jumped to humans from pigs, HIV from a monkey, and now Ebola. Ebola is now an epidemic uh, of the likes that we have not seen before. It's spiraling out of control. It is getting worse. It's spreading faster and exponentially. Where Ebola's hit the hardest? It's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Liberia, the epicenter. Not a lot of flights coming into Monrovia, and those that are coming in, they're screening everybody for Ebola. Surreal, uneasy, in the grips of something awful. Monrovia, Liberia is a capital under siege by the deadliest Ebola outbreak in history. Doctors and relief workers suited up like spacemen make their way through the streets in a race to contain the virus that so far they've been unable to stop. So they basically are checking who can come in and out of West Point. Only people with aid supplies and medical staff can go in and out, and soldiers. ABC News reporter Carrie L. Doe is Liberian-American, and she's been filing reports from a neighborhood here. Mr. how many bodies have you picked up today? Where thousands are under quarantine, she has watched as fear turned to despair. 
despair to anger, and then pandemonium. There's been looting and rioting. The only routes out are ones nobody wants to take by ambulance straight to an Ebola treatment center or in a body bag. Liberia is a country founded by freed American slaves. The president, Ellen Sirleaf Johnson, is Harvard educated and lived in New Jersey. And the main hospital is named for our own president, John F. Kennedy. This is the emergency room. And you can see there's no one going in, there's no one going out. That's because there are no doctors to take care of patients. There's no one here. No one here, it's a ghost town. This unit, it's, it's stuck back in the furthest corner of the hospital compound. It used to be used for, for treating people with cholera. And now it's where they're putting patients who, who may have Ebola. Many of them do. The facilities are makeshift. Their protective gear is the only barrier between them and the disease. They've had to make some of it themselves. They don't have hoods that are ready-made, so they're making hoods out of other protective equipment. The temperature, is it hot in what you're wearing? Oh, yeah, the heat. The, the heat, heat is too yeah, much? Yeah, too much. The place is not just like ordinary hospitals. If you are finished with what you want to do, you don't just leave and yeah. leave the others there. I'm okay. He's got a hood. He's got two levels, layers of gloves on, an apron, boots, outer clothing, a mask, and goggles, so that every part of his body, every inch of skin is totally covered up. Even though I've spent my career working on infectious diseases, I have to confess, this is scary. You don't touch anything. Okay? You just use your eyes. And you may talk to somebody, but you don't touch anything. Okay. This is Ebola Zaire. Highly contagious, highly infectious, very dangerous. So you have to take very good care. Don't rush to help somebody. Don't pick up things. Don't panic. Okay? Stay calm. Stay calm. This is the Ebola isolation unit. He's about to go in. When he opens the door, you can take a look. Patients with Ebola are everywhere. The team is not allowed to go any further, even in all their protective gear. Ebola is named after the river in the Congo, where the virus first appeared in 1976. There have been major outbreaks since then, but never like this. Cases began showing up in March of this year. In June, the first case walks into Monrovia's Elwa Clinic. My job in the Ebola unit was to make sure that doctors were suited up properly. At the time, Nancy Wrightball is a Christian missionary from North Carolina with no formal medical training. When doctors went in, I wanted to make sure that they were dressed properly. And when they came out, I wanted to make sure that they had been decontaminated properly. And I felt the weight of that, I can tell you. We've been in Ecuador uh, for five years. We were in Zambia for eight years. And, and then in Liberia, we've, we've traveled in many places. But they have no idea what they've signed up for this time. As the death toll mounts, Liberian health workers start to fall ill. I had a co-worker who um, ended up having Ebola um, and died. And I had trained him um, for three nights. By midsummer, one by one, eight organizations make the wretching decision to pull out of Liberia. But the right balls stay. So do doctors Kent Brantley and John Fankhauser, physicians and fellow missionaries who work at Nancy's clinic. Our hospital is a busy, you know, 45 to 50 patients at any one time, uh, three to five surgeries uh, delivering, you know, four or five babies every day, where we'd see, you know, 150 patients a day. So each of us took our turn seeing patients in the clinic as well. So it was very busy, very full, very clinical. They don't realize they are in the midst of the worst Ebola outbreak in history. The problem? This outbreak has come to such a densely populated place. 
Two years ago, there was one in Uganda, across the continent. Back then, Dr. Besser traveled deep into the jungle to rural villages, very far from any city. Wrapping up this, this epidemic is all about going down these roads, finding any possible case. It's really hard work. He and his producer were the only outsiders permitted to travel with the CDC team into the epicenter with unprecedented access into the wards of suffering. Just try, just try and stay calm. Yeah. It's, it is quite frightening if, uh, if you suddenly yeah. start to find breathing difficult. Right. Uh, don't touch your masks. That's the rules. Okay. Very good. This time, good. Besser was allowed to go inside, but it was too dangerous to allow his producer to follow. He went in alone with only a small camera. I have to say that there are a few things that I've, I've done in medicine that are as nerve wracking as, as going into this place. Those are the three who have Ebola. Yes. I'm doused with bleach again and again. It's hot in there. This outbreak was ultimately brought under control. Its isolation made it more possible to contain. But Ebola didn't go away. It may have been as early as December that this latest strain came out of the jungles in Guinea, along the open borders of three countries. And when it hit Liberia's biggest city, it exploded with a vengeance. Ebola travels through contact with bodily fluids, blood, diarrhea, vomit. And this is what makes this outbreak so dangerous. In an urban area with people packed on top of each other, Ebola has been almost impossible to stop. This is not just a threat to Liberia. This is not just a threat to West Africa or, or Africa. It's a threat to the world. If we don't turn it around, for every day it continues to spread, there's more and more risk of spread to other countries in Africa, other countries around the world. There is no way we can seal off and isolate a country, even if we wanted to. The real fear is that it could mutate into a smarter virus, turning airborne. It could infect with a single sneeze as millions of lethal pathogens fly through the air. In airports, crowded subways, children's playgrounds. A global pandemic that knows no borders. Coming up, a call to action. We have to move with force. As the virus turns on the American volunteers, brave enough to stand in its way. Really pretty sick. So they did the test. I did have Ebola. We have to act fast. We have to move with force. And President Obama now sounding the alarm, sending 3,000 US troops and 100 specialists to West Africa to the front lines of the battle against the deadly Ebola virus. Faced with this outbreak, the world is looking to us, the United States. Joining healthcare workers who have come from all corners of the globe in a race against the clock to beat back the pandemic. Will we see Ebola in America? I can't predict the future. What I'm sure of and what's happened already is that people have come from parts of the world where they might have been exposed and they've had fever. So we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to test, to isolate, and to respond. Already, Ebola is in five West African countries. The epicenter, Monrovia, Liberia. At the request of the Liberian government, we're going to establish a military command center in Liberia to support civilian efforts across the region. Henry Gray is running logistics here for Doctors Without Borders. So this is a 240 square meter tent. Building clinics here as fast as they can. This group is on the front lines of every health crisis in the world but even they are overwhelmed. How much room do you have now in the 120 bed units? 120 bed unit is full. It's full. Full. And the patients who come here who need care? Unfortunately, we have, um, we have quite high mortality amongst the patients, so that, that frees up space. 
Before this outbreak, what's the largest center you've ever designed? Uh, earlier in this outbreak uh, in, in West Africa, I think we went up to about 80 beds, but prior to that, around 40 beds. 40 beds, yeah. And here, 10 times that. 10 times. Is the virus winning? The world has never seen Ebola as we're seeing it now, and the challenges are enormous. Ebola is sneaky. The first symptoms look just like flu or malaria. Achy muscles, a headache, fever. The patients have probably delayed coming in, tried to convince themselves they don't have the virus. Going into the triage unit here at JFK Hospital, that's where they try and sort out whether a patient coming in has Ebola or something else. They're having yeah, diarrhea, okay. stomach pain, vomiting, some are bleeding from the mouth. Uh -huh. Another person is bleeding from the injection site. And how will you know if that's Ebola or something else? Because the majority of them have interacted yeah, with people who died. All along the way, they're spraying with chlorine so that if there have been any Ebola leakages, they're killing it with the bleach. So what happened? One of the patients just uh, died from the chair just on arrival. I spent here like 20 to 30 minutes. So by the time they get from triage into the building, some of them have died. Yeah. And Ebola can kill you in so many ways. Severe dehydration. Your kidney and liver shuts down. You may even bleed to death. The sheer number of cases coming in make it very dangerous for those patients who don't actually have Ebola. They're sitting near the patients who are sick. Is that a problem? Well, once they bring somebody who doesn't have an infection in here, then they have exposed that person. But we take so many precautions inside there. Yeah, but for the patients who come in, if he didn't have Ebola before, he may have it now. Yeah, the, the risk is high. We are spraying all the time, and we limit movement. We don't have enough space where to yeah, put this. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's... Too many out. patients. Yeah. You need more space, more treatment yeah. facilities. We need more beds. When Dr. Besser came back to the clinic the following day, they had 10 more dead, 30 more sick, and they were turning patients away. How many patients are you seeing? How many? 80. Yesterday, they said there were 60. They keep coming. There's three patients waiting to be seen, but nowhere for them to go. No beds. It's full. At the Elwa Clinic, Dr. John Fankhauser is relieved that reinforcements are arriving. For most of the summer, he and his colleague, Dr. Kent Brantley, were among the few American doctors who stayed. Kent Brantley, he's a family physician, much like me. Kent was drawn to the Ebola work, and when Samaritan's Purse uh, offered to run the newer Ebola unit, uh, they named Kent as the, the medical director. By midsummer, his fellow evangelical missionary, Nancy Wrightball, had gone from hospital administrator to decontaminator. When uh, Ebola hit, Nancy stepped into the position of not only our head hygienist, but also training the other hygienists that were um, coming alongside. And so she, she had a position that was never inside the unit. When we got suited up, she would make sure that uh, we were suited up appropriately and not in inch of skin was showing and then when we came out of the unit Nancy was in charge of spraying us down and decontaminating us those are critical jobs exactly very critical she understood the risks but even that didn't protect her one hot day in July Nancy Wrightball started to feel ill I first knew Nancy was sick on on her birthday I was running fever I had had malaria once in this past year and it was just the same symptoms Dr. Brantley was also sick, and so Dr. Fankhauser took on a job he never thought he'd have, caring for his friends. Kent became ill the day after Nancy became ill, and uh, I found out about it after he had uh, spent a day at home, and uh, he had had fever for about you know, 12 or 14 hours solid, uh, and, and I, I, I was concerned uh, the next morning um, can contact me and, and, and was actually doing doing worse. By Saturday, I was still not doing very well, and the doctors came back and said, Nancy, we don't really think you have Ebola, but we want to do the test anyway just to set everybody's mind at ease. 
it seemed almost impossible with how cautious both of them were. We were really trying to convince ourselves that this was some other form of illness, maybe dengue fever or some other type of illness that would be mosquito-borne or, or, or could have uh, infected him and caused similar symptoms. And still ahead, an experience that becomes all too real for American caregivers working here. There's a fire straight from the pit of hell. They weren't sure I would even make it to the U.S. And then, is there a cure? Ebola inside the deadly outbreak. Here in Liberia, in the grips of the deadly Ebola epidemic, even the heroes are scared. Doctors and medical volunteers are vulnerable. In some outbreaks, they account for a quarter of all Ebola deaths. We closed off our program in April of this year. It just wasn't safe. We didn't think that we had the necessary precautions to do it safely. American doctor James Sirleaf is the son of Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. He left his practice in Georgia to help with the crisis, only to find panic and chaos. The NGO community has mostly left. Yeah. We had to pull our physicians. We can't risk these people are not Ebola-trained doctors. It's just not safe to have them here. While others pulled out, many of those who stayed were missionaries. And by early August, Americans Dr. Kent Brantley and Nancy Wrightball had serious symptoms. How do you tell the love of your life that they've contracted a deadly disease and that there's, you know, a, a, a chance, a great chance that, that she might not survive? It fell to Nancy's husband, David, to deliver the diagnosis. He said, I want to tell you that Kent, Dr. Brantley, his Ebola test has come back and it's positive. It was hard to hear that. And then, and then David said, um, and Nancy, you have Ebola also. The odds are not good. <laughs> Among Liberians, more than half of those with the disease are dying. There is one slim hope. A new drug called ZMAP still being tested on monkeys. Dr. Brantley is the first human patient. Their charities hire a plane to transport them home over 4,000 miles in a specialized medical isolation pod, sealed to protect everyone on board. When I got on the flight in Liberia, I wondered if I would ever see David again. Um, it, we felt like it was it was pretty critical. I don't remember much of the flight at all. Um, pretty dehydrated, um, really pretty sick. They weren't sure I would even make it to the U.S. They are taken to Emory University in Atlanta, a different medical universe, one of four high-tech centers in the country designed to handle the most deadly and contagious diseases. People who say that you should not have been allowed back in the country. It's just too dangerous. What do you say to that? I would say that uh, in, in coming back into the country, we understand the uh, concern for public health. Having said that, there have been established procedures and, and protocols that we took very great care in observing. Most important, Nancy is isolated from everyone, even her own husband. It's a really lonely place to be. We put our hands on the glass and, you know, I, I, I told her again, she's the most beautiful woman I know. It is her family and faith that got her through. I think um, one of the scripture, it's a psalm that so many people know, um, that the Lord is my shepherd. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Some Americans say that you had no business being over there. It's too risky. We went to serve, but when you go to serve, you count the cost, but um, you lay it down. You lay down those fears. You lay down what you think might happen. Then, finally, the news that both the Wright Balls and Kent Brantley have been praying for. They are virus-free. Today is a miraculous day. I'm thrilled to be alive, 
to be well, and to be reunited with my family. But still ahead, what awaits American troops as they head for the hot zone? Panic in the streets. And can they help Ebola's youngest victims?